Hello and welcome back to my channel. My name's Dr. James Gill and you've joined me for something slightly to the side of clinical skills. I've been joined by, well, a friend from ancient times. Hi. So I knew Adam before I went to medical school, but we've ended up in a medical field. So Adam, what does you do? So I'm a radiographer, more accurately a reporting radiographer. Okay. Now I frequently get radiologist and radiographer mixed up. And I am in no way bitter about it. <laughs> Which of the dark box dwellers are you? So, by trade, I'm a radiographer. So, for about a decade, I spent a long time taking x-rays. And technically, I'm a reporting radiographer. So, what that means is that I look at the x-rays and write down what's on them. Well, I did that in A&E. Yeah, badly. <laughs> 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 Points to Adam. <laughs> We, we need to have a score sheet for this one. Okay, no, absolutely. So we've got that bit cleared up and that kind of gives an idea about why Adam is here today. So we've done plenty of work on um, clinical skills in terms of respiratory histories and things and respiratory examinations. But today we're going to look at how to assess a chest x-ray. And that's going to be both, is it any good in terms of having pressed the button? and <laughs> Is there any problems on it in terms of looking at what you know the X-ray is showing us? Perhaps one freebie that you'll get for pressing the button. Okay, just one. <laughs> um, it's worth checking that I think the plan for today is an introduction to the chest X-ray and very very basic assessment of it. Um, but hopefully, if you guys like it, we'll come back and look at it in a bit more detail. Absolutely. So it's vitally important as a medical student or a radiography student. <laughs> and junior doctors, that uh, we can assess a chest x-ray on the fly, if you will. Now, I'm relatively rusty at looking at chest x-rays. Whereas I was looking at them literally yesterday. <laughs> I will um, do a radiology request and send it up, say, you know, please uh, assess this patient, and I'll get back, you know, a, a, you know, a whole epistle which basically says nothing found. Well, exactly. It's, the question is, what do you want to know? Because there's so much there that we can just sum up with no abnormality detected. And actually, I suppose that's a really crucial thing to highlight there. It's about the asking the right question. If I just send an extra request up to Adam with, please assess this patient, what am I asking him to assess for? I mean, in terms of writing the forms, what do you want to hit on it? Um, what we want to know is, what are the symptoms? how long have they had them for, and what do you think the problem is likely to be. There will be always be incidental findings that we'll try and pick up, but particularly with chest radiography, there are so many appearances that can be equivocal without the clinical context that if we don't know the other side of the story, we can't give you a decent answer from our end. So just breathless patient query cause probably doesn't cut it. It really doesn't. I mean, we'll do our best, but in terms of providing the best answer to you and the best care that you can give to your patient, the more you give us, the more we can give back. Absolutely. So I'm going to get that report, but if we're on the wards and we need to be able to assess that x-ray ourselves, we're going to go through that today. So Adam, we've got a chest x-ray up here. So walk, walk me through how we're going to assess this and how you know we're going to be able to talk about what we can see to a senior. All right. So first thing, perhaps the most important thing, it's just the correct patient's x-ray. Let's start at the very beginning, you know, and it's check everything first. Is it the right name? Is it the right date of birth? Is it their right hospital number? Because you get patients with the same name and the same date of birth, but they really shouldn't have the same identifying numbers in your own admin. Once we're certain that we're looking at the right x-ray, have we got the right body part? We're going to assume that in this case, we wanted a chest x-ray. Once we know that we've got the right patient and the right part of the body, we're off to a winning start. Then we need to make sure that we've got everything on that we need to see and that it's presented in such a way that we can assess it. One for the radiographers in the audience, particularly the older ones, is that there's a marker on so we know which side is the left side of the patient. And you always look at an x-ray as if the patient is facing towards you. This is why you must never ask a radiographer for directions because we will get left and right wrong the entire time in real life because we're used to looking at things the other way around. And I think with that, it, it's really worthwhile to highlight at this point that we know the heart is on the left, but on the x-rays, it's going to be on the right side of the screen. And you can see that on scrubs where they got it wrong, where they put the x-ray up the wrong way around thinking, hold on, my heart is on the left. 
the heart was on the left on the screen. There's always been a bug bear of mine. Yeah, my heart, my, my brain was wincing a little bit just saying it's on the left. See, the thing, your heart is actually central, but the left ventricle is bigger and noisier. So it, it sounds like it's on the left and it is more of it on the left, but it's really in the middle with a little bit over to the left. It's not like it's, it's, not like it's down here. Well, my apex beats all the way down here. Well, that's something for you and a different medical professional. <laughs> okay, so we're looking at the x-ray. We've got the left side um, identified because someone's put a nice helpful L up there. Okay. Yes. So what do we want to include? That's probably the best thing because, you know, you won't always get it all there. Let's start. Have we got everything on that we need to see? Um, at the top of the image, we want to see the apices of the lungs. At the bottom, we want to see the bases of the lungs, which you can see with the costophrenic angles. And at the sides, you want to see the lateral margins of the ribs. There is an argument to be made that you want to see the skin edges, but depending on the size of your patient and what you're looking for, you can end up giving far more x-rays than you mean to if you wanted to include the edges. And not least of all, we're limited by the a size of the equipment that we can use. There's only so much you can fit on. So for this x-ray, I can see edges of the clavicles, I can see the top of the lungs, and I can see the costophrenic angles at the bottom. So I can see all of the lungs. I'm happy to start trying to work out what's going on. Am I ready to look at it yet? Or have I still um, got more to know? We're getting there, certainly. So we've got everything on that we want to see. Then we need to make sure that the x-ray itself was of sufficient quality. Have we fired enough x-rays to get through the patient. And essentially, you want to be able to make out the lung markings, uh, both over the lungs and behind the heart, and see some of the bony detail as well. So in terms of the lung markings, they were talking about those sort of beautiful sort of spiderweb type um, uh, impressions on the lungs. Yeah. Yes, yeah, they're denser towards the middle and they get steadily fainter as uh, they get smaller. Technically, we want to be able to see the spinous process of T4 projected behind the mediastinum. That's how you know you've got enough x-rays at it. But I was worried that that was too much for episode one. <laughs> okay, no, it's, it's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll work with that. Okay, so I can see what it looks like. I can see the lungs are in there. I can see that um, you've um, pressed the button hard enough. Oh, God, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> so we've got to go through a mental list. So we've got our entrance on. We've given enough um, x-rays. Um, is the patient standing straight up? Is it rotated? That's uh, something that I'm told you get taught at medical school. Mm -hmm. So we check this by looking at the medial ends of your clavicles, which are here and here, and they want to be equidistant from the spinous process. If it's rotated, that could mimic pathology. If it's underexposed, that could hide pathology. So it's worth having a comment on the quality of the thing that you're looking at before you even think about the pathology. That's interesting. Not to go down too far in a rabbit hole, but you say uh, uh, an abnormally rotated film could mimic pathology. Can you give me an example? Uh, absolutely. So um, there's such a thing called mediastinal shift where the heart can move to one side to the other. There are lots of things that could cause this, things like pneumothorax and effusions and collapse of the lung. Watch for those in episode two. Yes, uh, maybe three. Um, and... If the patient is turned, you'll see the mediastinum go to the side. If you do not realise that it's because the patient has turned, you will see what you think is a horrible pathology. The patient might be normal, they're just wonky. Ah, okay, I'll look out for my wonky patients. Yeah. So we've got the rotation covered, we've covered the exposure, and we've confirmed that we, we can see what we want to see. Okay. Can I get into medicine yet, or have we still got other bits? I think we're getting there. I mean, we will need to consider what things can we actually see on the chest x-ray. Okay. But before we get to that, let's talk a little bit more about how we obtained it, because this isn't very blurry. And the reason it isn't blurry is because the patient is holding their breath. The patient has to hold their breath because you want to fully inflate the lungs and it stops them moving. If you don't fully inflate the lungs, they're shorter, they're more compact, um, you can get sort of artifactual compression of the lungs and it can sometimes, when it collapse, it will sometimes make the heart look larger than it is. And measuring the width of the heart is a rule of thumb for checking for things like heart failure. So in terms of that, you said that that patient is going to take in a deep breath. So to my mind, I'm going to straight away look at the diaphragm then. How am I going to determine a patient's taken a really deep breath versus someone who, you know, COPD, they've got hyperinflated lungs anyway? Well, with C when you have COPD, the problem is sorts itself out for you because they've got hyperinflated lungs, so you don't need to worry about inflating them in terms of image quality. But to make sure that they have breathed in enough, you count the ribs. So we can look at the anterior ribs and the posterior ribs. They're the same bone 
but there's a bit at the front and a bit at the back. And I'm just going to count these down now. We can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and a hint of the ninth posterior rib. That's how we know we've got enough. So th this, this is the level of feedback I get from colleagues as a GP. They're helping me count. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> you can never underestimate people enough, can you? <laughs> A pox on you and your <laughs> poxy radiology cupboard. <laughs> radiography cupboard. Um, and there's also and there's six anterior ribs as well. Uh, essentially, that's the minimum. I think we've got slightly more than that on this x-ray. So this patient is young and healthy and taking in a very nice deep breath. Okay. So we've got a rotation. We've got our exposure. We know that everything's there. We can see that we've got nicely inflated lungs and we've counted down the ribs. Yes. Where next? I think we've done it for image quality now, so I think we can actually start talking about whether or not there's any pathology. Okay, let's talk about medicine. Yeah, yeah, I have value once again. <laughs> what do you want to know about this patient, James? <laughs> so for the sake of argument, this is a normal chest x-ray required as part of um, a, an insurance medical. So we're not expecting to find anything, but how can you show us that there's nothing on there? Well, many are varied. The short answer is the heart and mediastinal contours are within the normal limits and the lungs appear clear which is pretty much my standard form for a chest x-ray where there's nothing very interesting on it. Um, but what we know from that is we're not worried about your heart, we're not worried about your breathing, and those are the things that generally get people's attention first. Okay, so I can go along with that. You've told me that the lungs seem fine and the heart seems fine, but I'm in A&E and you've just told me, yeah, these things are fine. How do I know that? What do I have to do to be able to look at these lungs and look at the heart and say that they're normal? Okay. Um, now, when it comes to assessing the patient, you can do it in any order you like, but I would say always do it in the same order so you've learned to make sure that you've done it right. Um, I always like to start at the very top, work my way down, back around and back up again. Um, I would look at this once I've assessed that we've got sufficient technical quality, I look at the apices of one lung, move all the way down that lung, start at the apices of the other side, move down that lung, then look at the heart and mediastinum, then go back into the look at the review areas, so underneath the liver, behind the heart, back at the apices again. Then consider the bony thorax. The important thing is that you do everything systematically and make sure that you take in everything and that you don't stop searching once you've seen something because some patients are unlucky and have more than one pathology. Oh dear. So uh, as you say, um, that, that's of, uh, I think that's described as walking around the chest that way. I've also seen it with an A, B, C, D, E approach. So looking for airways, breathing, cardiac, um, the diaphragms and then everything else. So, with that in mind, let's walk around the chest x-ray, as you said. So, we'll start off looking at the apices and the lung fields. Walk me through this. We don't say lung fields, we only say fields if there's a tractor in it. Okay, duly noted. So, the lungs themselves are divided into lobes. There's three lobes on the right and there's two lobes on the left. But when I am assessing a chest x-ray, I think of them in terms of zones, which are the upper, middle and lower zones. Or you can be inferior, middle and superior zones if you'd like to write longer words in your reports. Now with that, are you separating the apices or are they considered, uh, considered in your upper zone? Both. I would say it depends on the size of the thing that you've seen. Because if you've got a tiny pneumothorax, that will just be in the apex. But as something gets larger, it takes up the middle, the upper zone. I would say it's roughly thirds. And again, the zones is not a thing that's based in anatomy. It's based on the appearance of the x-ray itself. Um, the lobes themselves are an awkward mishmash of shapes that do not fit neatly into segments and they overlap each other. We have a 2D representation of a 3D image, a 3D structure, I should say. So it is easy to make a mistake of thinking something is in the wrong lobe, but if you are describing it down the phone to someone who doesn't necessarily have the x-ray in front of them, if you say it's in the upper zone, they're going to know where to look. If you say it's in the middle zone, they're going to know where to look. But if you say it's in the middle lobe, it's a little more ambiguous. Okay, that makes sense. So we're looking over the, uh, the lung zones and talk to me about what, what I'm looking at in those zones in terms of the lung parenchyma, the squidgy bit that we breathe. Exactly. So the lungs themselves are a mishmash of vascular tissues and air. 
and what we're looking at is the lung markings that are surrounded by air. And what we look for essentially is, is there fluid where there shouldn't be fluid? Is there air where there shouldn't be air? I think that's it. <laughs> like, like, like ultimately, yeah. dark gray, good, very dark gray, bad, light gray, sometimes good, light gray, also might be bad. Essentially, that's trite, but you're looking at things other than how you expect them to be. Okay, so for example, if we were to see um, a space-occupying lesion or something like that with a cancer, again, we're looking at those differences in densities as much as anything. Exactly. With something like a lesion, um, it will typically be denser and it will be well-defined, whereas if this thing is more infective, it's more likely to be more diffuse. So we've looked over the, uh, the, the zones of the lungs, mm -hmm. then we need to go across to the middle for the tubes, the breathy bits, the bronchus. What are we looking at there? Here was me worried I'd be too lowbrow. <laughs> so in the mediastinum, at the very, very top, we have the bronchus attached to your mouth. It's the tube through which you breathe. And that comes down the center of the chest and it bifurcates at a point called the carina, goes off into your left and right bronchus and then into your bronchioles. Um, as something that I'm sure you can talk to me about is that you look for an aspiration because the right inferior bronchus is steeper than the rest. So it's the place where something, if something's fallen down there, that's where it's gonna fall. Absolutely, and if I've got a child that's come into the A&E department with an acute onset shortness of breath, sudden onset, or an acute onset cough, particularly that's happened whilst they're playing, I need to have a look in the bronchus, particularly so on the right side, to see if they've breathed you know, in a grape or something like that that's then lodged in there, causing that sudden onset pathology. Okay, so we've covered the lungs, we've covered the bronchus. I think that pretty much covers most of the airway and breathing, other than the very bases uh, with the costophrenic angles. So what do we look at down there? The costophrenic angles are just the very, very edges of your lungs. They should be nice and well-defined. They can become blunted, which is often the manifestation of either thickening of the pleura, which again, anatomy will get to on another time, or something called a pleural effusion, which is a buildup of fluid. So uh, we're now needing to have a look at the heart. So centrally, as you say. Yes. So um, your heart consists of four chambers. Uh, left and right atrium and left and right ventricles. As I said before, the ventricle is the noisy one and that pumps the blood through the rest of your body and the, uh, sorry, the left ventricle pumps it through the rest of your body, whereas the right ventricle pumps it into the lungs. Um, your heart, again, it's in the center. It's in a region that we'll call the mediastinum. Uh, which contains all of the vascular structures. Just above the heart, we can see a little lumpy bumpy bit sticking out, um, which is the arch of the aorta. That goes up from the heart, arches round, and then goes back down, and then through the diaphragm. I've, I remember at medical school, people talking about seeing the aortic root unfolding on x-rays and things. That's always been something I struggled to see. Um, well, you won't see it on this one because it's not. Um, but unfolding is something that's as I understand things, normal progression. It is just part of the aging process. Um, it's nice and straight when you're younger and as you age, it can become a little more wobbly, essentially. Fair enough, fair enough. So you mentioned the hyalur regions there. Um, what's going on there? Because they automat they look when, uh, you know, in first year of medical school, looking at chest x-rays, I always w was worried that there was something going on in the hyla because it looked different from the rest of the lung field. Well, it's worth being worried about because assessing these bits is hard. Um, they are complicated structures made up of lots of vascular structures that it's essentially where the blood is throwing from your heart throughout the lungs. Um, ultimately, they are at about broadly the same level. The right one typically sits higher than the left. And they should be of uniform density and a similar shape. One of the difficult things about looking at chest x-rays compared to looking at other parts of the body is their men appearances are many and varied and what's normal for that patient. It is unfortunately something you have to get your eye in on. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's like looking at patient, uh, back on patients' ECGs. Can we review, has there been any change from no their normal? Uh, exactly, yes. So the heart then sitting just over the diaphragm, what comments can we make on that? So the width of the heart typically should be no more than half of the width of the chest itself. There's been some recent research about how good a cardiothoracic ratio is as a measurement tool for pathology, but ultimately 
the rule of thumb is it shouldn't be any bigger than that. Okay. So to my mind, that's covered most of the things that we need to look at in terms of the actual chest pathology from a, you know, a shorter breath patient. What else do we want to look at? What's the, you know, the summarising things in the every part? Once we've looked at our heart and lungs, um, there's a lot more on that than just there. There's a whole lot of bones. Um, I mean, when I started radiography, I was shocked that we did more chest x-rays than anything else. I thought it was all bony stuff. Um, but it's worth having a look. Have they got any fractures? Have they got any lesions? Um, you can often pick up some degenerative changes on there. Um, it may not be relevant to what your patient has arrived for, but there's a wealth of knowledge there to that you can assess for. Okay. So I think that's a, uh, an excellent walk around in terms of the chest x-ray we've got. So just to recap that overview of the chest x-ray, we've confirmed the patient's date of birth, we've gone over the technical aspects and we're happy with the film, we've looked over um, the airways in terms of looking at the bronchus um, and the carina, we've looked over the parenchyma of the lungs, looking over the zones, not fields, <laughs> uh, we've looked at the diaphragm, we've talked about the costophrenic angles at the base of the diaphragm as well, we've looked at the heart and we've determined that everything else is normal on that chest x-ray. So I'd be happy with a, a student presenting that to myself. From a radiology perspective, what would you want one of your students to add in with that? Um, so for mine, I would look at the technical quality first. Certainly if it's a student radiographer, it's their job to make sure that they've got a good image. And we go through a thing called a 10 point check, which we don't need all 10 points of today, but ultimately, is it of sufficient quality? Have you got everything on that you need to see? Is there anything else that you need to do? Well, I think that's uh, a reasonable point for us to end this overview of the chest x-ray. Um, this is a, going to be an evolving uh, series and we've got ideas about what we want to include, covering pathology and uh, things such as that, so there's the medical bent to it. But what do you guys want us to cover as well, whether you're medical students, whether or not you're radiologists, radiography <laughs> students, or both you sides, <laughs> I'm covering both sides. So, you know, please drop a comment down below and we'll see if we can service those needs. Yeah, I say, or are you any form of student or are you just interested, you know? Yeah, I'm quite happy point. to teach it to anybody. Um, I had a point then, it's fluttered away. Um, oh, yes. Um, there's a lot more to radiography than chest x-rays. Um, we would like, or I would like, to discuss about all of them if time permits. So if you want to hear about those, uh, let us know below. Hey, I certainly do. From my perspective, I'm distinctly looking forward to um, discussions about hip x-rays um, because we see so many patients with hip pathology and hip problems. It's like, whereabouts are we drawing the lines and things like that? So that should be very useful. We can do that. Right, well, thank you very much. If you consider, if this video has been useful to you, please hit the like button because that's how it tells YouTube we're here. And if you want notifications for when we're doing the next one, please hit the subscribe button and we'll see you in the next one. Take care. Thank you. Cheerio.